In 1984, the airwaves were dominated by big name acts like Van Halen, Michael Jackson, and Bruce Springsteen. But there was something else out there, an alternative if you will. The Talking Heads were a breath of fresh air in Reagan's America. With their concert film Stop Making Sense, they created a fun piece of pop music with an art house sensibility. Director Jonathan Demme had a huge career ahead of him with movies like Silence of the Lambs, but this was the apex for the Heads, who dissolved not long after. There isn't any alcohol mentioned in the film, so we went with bourbon, and not the esoteric sort that David Byrne would approve of. So, pour yourself your favorite Kentucky spirit and ask yourself, how did I get here? It's time for episode 59 of Toasting the Classics, Stop Making Sense. Welcome, everybody. I am Clint Lanier. Dave MacArthur. Welcome to Toasting the Classics, where we take something that's supposed to be a classic, we look at it, we dance with it, we lick it, we taste it, measure it up, and we decide if it is a classic or not, because we are those kind of people. And while doing so, we have ourselves some type of drink connected to said supposed classic. So what are we doing uh, this time around there, Dave? So we're doing um, what is considered one of the greatest concert films of all time, uh, Stop Making Sense by The Talking Heads, or, or rather by Jonathan Demme, but The Talking Heads star in it. Featuring or starring The Talking Heads, Featuring right? Featuring or starring, or whatever you want to call it. I'm pretty sure they had some creative uh, direction. Unfortunately, the connection to the drink is pretty tenuous because there was no drinking involved. <laughs> right. This at all. I, I couldn't think of any puns about talking heads or stop making sense uh, probably if i thought about it some more but when i looked it up i found a video of a guy interviewing a, a bourbon aficionado interviewing david byrne and david byrne byrne kind of being into bourbon and talking right, about bourbon. right now what was it what was the name of the bourbon he was in it, yeah I'm, I'm looking i'm looking for it right now was it like on a podcast or it was a youtube video youtube video okay and it was jeff the something bourbon let me see let's let's look this up but it was way too hard to get i mean i looked there's a decent selection of bourbon Je- oh Jephthah jep the jep the creed yep the creek jep right the creed which is a oh, creed not even creek. okay most <clears throat> bourbons are always named after some creek i guess where they get their water but this is jep the creed so um when when we talked about it and, he, and you said uh, i think he's into bourbon i said what did i tell you it would have to be very weird and obscure right. and uh Hard to come by. Hard to come by. Probably very expensive. And I think I think it hits all those marks. So, so but any, anyway, this is all in a way to say what we're drinking, which is what? Which is bourbon. We went right. with some bourbon. I've got Woodford Reserve. That's my okay. surprise. Um, I just got something that I like and didn't break the bank. Um, it was about 20 bucks for 375 milliliters. I don't know what that costs in New Mexico. How does that compare? But we have a state-owned uh, beverage control facility here in virginia it's the only place where you can get uh alcohol or oh you're or in virginia rather. you're not you're not in the city huh no nope i'm in virginia right now we're doing a summer camps and summer vacation ah, thing. Got gotcha. you. Okay. hanging out okay. just enjoying not being in the city for a couple of weeks i thought you're gonna go down to your corner bodega and find something in there no no, yeah. no. it's you know it's not the it's not the bodega it is actually a liquor store that we go to mm. in new york it's okay got a great Got a great selection, but you have to ask through through things from the other side of bulletproof glass, <laughs> right? And wired. Do you have right. to? I think we talked about this last time. Do you have to slip your money money like under the tray or something like that, or into the tray, don't yeah. you? Yeah, like a like a gas station in L.A. <clears throat> right. <laughs> of all the places to get knocked over, I feel like liquor store is the second half of that phrase very often. So it makes yeah. Sense. Well, I mean that's almost cliche, right? We're going to go right. knock over a liquor store. So I'm I'm having uh, Evan Williams. Bottled and Bond bourbon, which is is pretty good. It's a little bit higher octane than the normal. Bottled and Bond just means that it's it's uh, bottled under government supervision. These they have to do that. Um, I think this is it back to pre prohibition, and what okay. what they did because there were no standards. I don't believe there are any standards pre prohibition on on booze and alcohol. There weren't. I mean, all of that came about as a result of prohibition, the laws and standards on alcohol and so forth uh, regulations. And uh, so to, to ensure that this stuff was good, they would have the U.S. government would inspect it. And uh-huh. then the, the government would actually put a seal on the, on the, uh, on the barrel 
Uh, and then actually a seal on the rack house where we store the barrels to say, yeah, we've inspected it. The stuff is good. It you know, meets all of our. And then when you would buy it, obviously it would say bottled and bond, inspected by the U.S. government. And back when we trusted the U.S. government, we thought, hey, that's really cool. You know, that, that I can trust this stuff. Was there not moonshine before prohibition? Or no, very much so. But see, that was the problem that there was there was nothing in place to ensure that it wasn't rot gut. To be called bourbon, for example, you have to be aged, I believe, three years or something like that. I mean, there are standards in place that ensure that what you're getting is actually, you know, it's not going to make you go blind. But back then, even in a bottle, even with a label on it, you never knew. And, uh, and so what they did is they did this bottled bond stuff to let the government look at it and make sure that it was good. And that would kind of put their stamp of approval on it. Okay. I think now, I think nowadays uh, it would be like a conspiracy theory, you know. Half the side of the country would say, well, I don't trust it because it says government inspected. And the other half would say, I don't know what the other half would say. But now it, now you can imagine all the conspiracy theories. They'd be very rising. enthusiastic about government inspections. As, right, as what, right. As I would as be as curious as to know if, if anybody in Rage Against the Machine has ever bought bottled and bond bourbon. Because if so, then that would defeat their whole existence, I think. But is that, the, is that the boomerang theory where you come back around and you're so far to the left that you might as well be on the far right with the uh, Rage Against the Machine? I, I think so. Well, I think right, I mean, the whole Rage's whole thing was don't do, we will never do what you want us to do type of thing. I mean, it was, you can't tell us what to do, especially the government. And, uh, you know, the government is all fascist. I mean, they're anarchists basically. So, or they okay. used to be anyway. But right. in any case, so that's what that's what we're drinking this this round about. So, so it's a stretch. It's a stretch, but you know what? Any any excuse to drink bourbon, I think, is probably worth taking. So I agree. I agree. So it. um, so what? So I have to say, I had to I had to kind of twist myself into pretzels into into figuring out how we work this because this is classified as a film, and we just watched a film. We watched uh, Longest Day. I thought a music, I thought a concert film yeah. was sort of a, was sort of looser. And also, we did say, really, technically, you can pick anything for for that, choice. That, that's a good point. That's a good point. But, and I think I think what saves it is, like you said, it is a concert. It's a film of a concert. It's not like Hard Day's Night or you know Yellow no. Submarine or something. It's not like a musical. It's a no. It's just a concert. So. Yeah, I think it's that not works. like you know, walk the line with Johnny Cash. It's not a bio. <laughs> right. Bi biopic. Yeah, it's definitely it's like a music video of a concert. Yeah. Right. Um, it's different than a concert because it's three different days of concert. It's not the same audience. There's actually a lot that was going on with the audience apparently in the filming of it, which um, answers some of my questions about that. Uh, but we can talk about that in a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and have a sip of bourbon to start sure. out. Yep, perfectly good. All right, so. What'd you, what did you think of it? What do you think of this band in general? Is this one that you liked back in the day? or? Yeah, yeah. I've always liked the Talking Heads. I was never, you know, I was, they were sort of before me. So I I would have been cognizant of music. My first album that I ever owned was uh, License to Ill, right? So okay. BC Boys, License to Ill came out maybe 1986, somewhere, something like that, I'd say. 87, something like that. Talking Heads were about 82, something mm -hmm. like that, 80, 80, 82. So they were a little bit before me, right? Uh, I have an older cousin who was really into them, and she's she's about ten years older than me. So she would have been a teenager when this stuff came out. I was still like you know six or seven. No, I guess I was uh, yeah, I was born in seventy four, so I was about six years old when they. I guess about eight years old when they peaked. So it was plus it's really it's really esoteric <laughs> stuff. And it's not it pop music. It's not kids music. I remember burning down the house being on the radio. Burning that down the house the was yeah. That was a radio song, and it would have been about 1984, and I did mm -hmm. like it. It was kind of like there, there were some things that would get play on the radio here, right? like, say, Tears for Fears, mm -hmm. and those were always my favorite songs, but they weren't that popular on the radio. A lot of the you know usual pop music and stuff was more popular, but occasionally there'd be one of these sort of British alternative bands. This one's not British. I probably right. would have thought they were. If you'd asked me, I probably would have thought that and there is a British connection. David Byrne, I think his parents were from Scotland, right? Yeah. There's a little bit of the, the, the music there is a little bit different. But um, the, a lot of these are my favorite songs. And I actually didn't discover them and start buying the albums until years later because they right. just weren't them. The, you'd right. hear them. I'd like The Cure is another good example. I loved The Cure when I was a little mm -hmm. kid, but it just wasn't the thing everybody was listening to. So I didn't get the albums until high school probably right. years and right. years later i started discovering oh you can actually go out and buy you know 
uh, New Order and 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 the Pet mm-hmm. Shop, all the stuff that I really liked when I was a kid. Whereas yeah. m- most people just listen to Michael Jackson, you know, right. which is which is fine. Nothing wrong with Michael Jackson. I mean, sure. as a, as a musician, <laughs> sure. <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot wrong with Michael Jackson, but he's there's a great dancer. Was a great yes, dancer. But you know what's funny is is okay. So like Tears for Fears, I think their number one radio hit was probably Shout, which is a terrible song. Um, and then, and then after that, that and then after that, maybe everybody wants to rule the world, but mm-hmm. they had so many great songs. It's probably, it's actually just like talking heads where, um, burning down the house was a huge success, but there's so many great songs that never got in the airplay. Right. Um, they might, you know, go over people's heads. It might be a little bit too far out there and, or maybe they have like a bunch of weird, cause he, he'd like to bring in a lot of African stuff, you know, music. Um, you know, as, as additives. And, and so maybe we just had too much of that or whatever, but there's a little bit of crossing genres mm-hmm. for them. There's a little bit. So like a, I noticed, I looked up some of the people that were in the performance and it was a lot of people who used to be in like P funk and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of um, really funky R and B music right. that they're drawing the roots from and you can hear it in the music. Yeah. Um, but then it's also this sort of alternative rock thing getting mixed together. And I think that probably kills your popularity a little bit. So who, who's yeah. supposed to like this music? You know, it's, it's for somebody who really loves music, but it's not going to get casual radio play. Go ahead. I was going to say, although it did get a lot of MTV spins, which is a big deal at the time. I mean, that was, this yeah. is like prime MTV. And I remember their videos, because their videos were always like, they were always like mini movies, like short movies. You know, they uh-huh. weren't just like a lot of videos at the time where somebody it was like the band lip syncing, you know, acting as if they're singing right. to, the, you know, they're crooning to the camera. They, they had like little movies. I mean, they were like kind of weird, funky little things. Um, uh, so, you know, that I think that might have been why, because of the power of the videos that they made with them, which I'm sure Burns had a lot of input into. I'd, I'd be interested to see. I wonder how much they attribute their popularity to MTV. Um, literally the only one of their videos that i remember is burning down the house i do remember mm-hmm. that being on mtv but again i don't think mm-hmm. i discovered it until much later but there were always a couple of artists that did really good videos like peter gabriel mm-hmm. had yeah he did videos. like right. tom petty had amazing videos they were like yeah. little art films and stuff mm-hmm. like that uh and it would change how you thought about their work i, I really do miss that being a thing i, I miss <laughs> videos I and mean, videos still exist but they're not what they used to be. It's oh, not gosh, true. no. Yeah, absolutely not. I remember, the one I remember is mm-hmm. uh, uh, Wild uh, Wildlife from the Talking Heads because it had John Goodman in it. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't John remember. John Goodman was like, he was like dressed up like this cowboy businessman. You know how they're at, at a kind of like gentleman's club is the uh, the setting for it. And John Goodman's kind of like this, you know, this cowboy looking, you know, big timer that comes in and he's like throwing money around and stuff like that. You know what I got to do? I got to go and just put on, you go on YouTube and you click on talking heads, you know, whatever you put them burn, burning in the house. And then it'll give you like a, a playlist of all their videos and you can right. just sit there and watch them. I should do that sometime. Yeah. But that's the thing. That's why I don't watch them. Cause I have to go out of my way to sit down and watch YouTube to watch M- music videos. Whereas right. when I was a kid, if we were hanging out, MTV was just on. It was on like, in the background. Yeah. All the yeah. time. I, mean, we, yeah. I would have a sleepover. We would turn it on. We would watch it all night. Right. You know, Watch it through Headbangers Ball and watch it through yep. YoMTV Raps. YoMTV Raps, yeah. You know, yeah. neither of those was our favorite, but we'd watch it anyway. Uh, right. It was just, um, it was just such a cultural institution. It's impossible to explain to a kid today how much of a cultural yeah. institution that was. It's like blockbuster video. Those two things, if you'd have told me by two, <laughs> right. that those would yeah. be completely extinct, I wouldn't have believed you. Like, right, it right. Been- MTV is the one that doesn't make any sense because it still has the name MTV in it. <clears throat> is not at all related to what MTV stood for, but what do they do now? Just play reality shows about yeah, getting- like reality shows and stuff like that. You know, I think, you know, that must've been a really good time for an artist like David Byrne. He was an artist, right? He considered himself an artist and he certainly was an artist. He came out of a design school. He met all the bandmates at design school and mm-hmm. uh, he had a band in high school. And, and so he's a very creative, he's, he's like what we call a creative t- type, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so not only are you able to write music, do the lyrics, do the music, arrange it, all, everything else, but then also there's this film component right. that at the time you had to have a video. You, I mean, it was mandatory. 
right? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and absolutely. I'm sure if you if you looked up the credits for <laughs> probably ninety percent of of the videos that they put out, I'm sure he's attributed as yep. you know writing, probably doing a lot of the writing on them and 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 maybe even directing yeah, he, and producing. You know, he's the kind of guy he's like perfectly happy working in like eight different media at one time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. The music and doing some dance and doing the you know doing the video and then and then coming up with the fashion ideas you know for wearing yeah. a giant suit and stuff like that <laughs> i want one of those so bad I, yeah. i'm wondering i'm wondering if so there's a there's a comic con coming up over here you have a little comic con that we have yeah. in our town that'd be I great wonder, i wonder if i could dress up like that for anybody be great. there's huge shoulder pads you know yes there's going to be other 40 year old guys there don't worry yeah <laughs> That what a great costume that would be to a, an '80s party, like an '80s costume party. Yes, I, yeah, that's a really good idea. We Wouldn't had one great? in our house. We, we had an '80s costume party, and I, I was, I dressed as uh, Kurt Russell in Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, that's a was, good one. Yeah, which that's, was fun, but big that's a good suit, call. David Burns' big suit would have been yeah. really, <laughs> right. annoying. You'd be like turning around, and knocking over drinks off the <laughs> just with your shoulders. You couldn't fit through yes. the doorway. <laughs> exactly. No, so, I think. Uh, so what, so what did you think? What did you think of the concert? Um, you know, I liked it. It, it. I had to go out. I, I got to be honest with you. I had to go out and, and research. Why is this considered the best concert movie right? of all time? Right. And, um, and What'd once, well, I, I think what I came up with was that it was, you know, uh, just a focus on the band. First of all, they never cut away to the audience, which, which I didn't really even notice. But once they mentioned it, I was like, oh, yeah, huh. The new trend right now are comedy specials, right? Like Dave Chappelle or Bill Burr, whatever. They always have a comedy special. And invariably, they're always cutting away to the audience of them laughing, hmm. awesome. which, is, which is a stupid cutaway because you don't know if that audience is really there for that show. How would you know? It's like a laugh track. And, and if they are there for that show and they're laughing – how do we know that they're laughing to that joke? You know, maybe they're laughing at the warm-up guy. You know, you never know, right? Yep. So yep. Um, I, I can't believe laugh tracks were a thing. <laughs> we discussed that. Were, yeah. As long as they were a thing, it was like sixty years that there were always laugh tracks. And I think we discussed that with uh, with, um, uh, with all the, all in the family. In the family, yeah. Yeah, all in the family. The first laugh track, and we also talked about it in Scooby Doo. Uh huh. Got a laugh track. Laugh track of Scooby Doo, but um. Yeah, so I mean, they never cut away to the audience, so it's always a focus on the band. And then he just kind of lets the band do what they do. I was, I was, I was really kind of blown away by how simple the whole performance was. I don't know yeah. the last concert you've been to, but you know, most concerts today are this huge production numbers with all the synchronized junk. Um, not all of them. Um, I went to a, a concert recently. Um, I think the last one I went to was um, February of this year. Uh, What's that country country western singer? Um, Chris Stapleton. No, well, yeah, we did go to Chris Stapleton. That was last year, but this year yeah. we went to um, a thousand miles from nowhere. Um, he also sings. He's got like a hillbilly punk. He was in the uh, Sling Blade. He plays the the jerk oh, in Sling Blade. You're talking about you're talking about uh, Dwight Yoakam. Dwight Yoakam, right? We went to his concert, and it was just him, a drummer. A guitarist and then one guy that did played like 20 instruments which is pretty amazing sure. so with the exception of that one but like the chris stapleton one you know they had that was supposed to be country and they had all this production with horns and all these people up there mm -hmm. and everything was synchronized and blah 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 it's probably worth mentioning like we don't i mean you don't really need a synopsis of a concert film but there's a little bit of structure to it to talk about there is there is. So it's, yeah. it's, it's 1984, if, uh -huh. I'm, if I'm not mistaken. It's 1984. They're just releasing their album, um, kind of Speaking in Tongues. Speaking, Speaking in Tongues, in yeah. Tongues. yeah. Yep. So it, it's coming out the same year. So it's got the new music from that. But they decided to do a huge production for this. It's $1.2 million that they spent. They got a proper Hollywood film director. I don't know right. actually what his track record was at the time, now that I think of it. His track record later is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan Demi. He comes out, David Byrne comes out by himself, plays yeah. one, and then for the first part, so for the first part of the concert, we got one one singer, then somebody else joins him for the second song, and they keep doing that until they build right. up to eight or nine people on stage at one time. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big ensemble. And they do three different concerts on three different nights and string mm -hmm. them together, so everybody's changing clothes, and the set's completely different. 
Um, and that that's basically it. But there's there was a little bit of structure, I guess I should give the give the audience. If right. Have. Right. Yeah. It builds up. It builds up from him alone with a with a boom box, which I thought was cool right. as could be. Yeah. He, does, he, comes he, and he says, I want to play a tape. tape for you. <laughs> yeah, I want to play a tape for you. And then he starts playing Psycho Killer. And it was just which is yeah. honestly one of my favorite songs. But that was one of the earliest song. songs. Um, Great song. And then, uh, you know, and then, like you said, it builds up from there. There's this crescendo at the end where they're all on stage. I was actually I kind of wish that, you know, so you have that first one. By the time they cut from the first concert in the first day i guess actually we don't know if it was the first second or third but the the, the one they they right. show at the very first by the time they cut away from that you know his his suits untucked his hair is all completely disheveled and he's completely soaked i mean he's soaked in sweat yeah and and then they cut to the next one and he's wearing a suit again and i'm like i would have liked to have seen that one all the way through like how does he really look at the end of that one because he was right he was looking pretty tired you know drenched and everything um well, he's very, uh, uh, very energetic as a performer. He yeah, never he is, yeah. Uh, it's like uh, Jim Morrison or so- somebody who's just, just the, the, the singer is the center of attention. He's always yeah. doing something to get yeah. your attention, whether it's fall down on the stage or stagger around and dance with a lamp, you know, things like that. <laughs> right, right. Um, do, his, do his chicken dance thing, his chicken neck. Yes, there's a lot of that. I'm not a fan of the staggering around. I could do without yeah. that. I'm sure, I'm sure he has something he could explain to me for why he's doing that. But that was, <laughs> that was a bit of that went a long way. Um, you know, his, his mannerisms, he reminds me of Bill Nye, the science guy. Yeah. <laughs> meets, yeah. You know, meets Elvis Presley. I mean, he's like tall and lanky. And yep. then and then doing his weird knock knee dances and stuff like that. He, does and it was, he absolutely does. And, yeah. and he... But it was, but what was funny is it works, you know, he's, he's got that shirt button to the top. So he looks like a total geek, you know, which right. is the point. Uh, he's yep. a talking head, you know, it was, it, it just worked. And I guess there is kind of a geek, not a revival. I don't know. I don't know if there was anything to revive, but there was like a kind of a, it was cool to be, to be like geek chic. If that's a term we could, we can invent if it hasn't already been invented. But remember like Pee Wee Herman? Came yeah. along in like 84, 85, something like that. I mean, he had all these really geeky, skinny, weird looking, lanky. Yeah, maybe it was Revenge kind of, of the Nerds. Remember? Like, maybe, like yeah. Anthony Edwards' speech at the end of the movie where he's like, where he's like, I'm proud to be, I'm a nerd. I'm, I'm proud like to be a nerd. You know, I'm proud. Or maybe, or, or maybe that was in response to this kind of zeitgeist, right? Maybe. Uh, maybe. You know, the David Byrne and, and that kind of thing where, I mean, because he had Devo. Which is the band that they were kind of replicating in Revenge of the Nerds? So you had these yeah. geeky guys with a remember the um, the guitar keyboard. Remember that? Like they would wear the, a keyboard, yeah. like a, yeah, key, like a keytar, yeah. yeah, yeah, the hats. I don't know. It was it was cool to be a geek, I guess. I missed my time. Well, I, you know, I think actually today it seems to me as if like it's definitely in the zeitgeist today. I mean, there's nerds are everywhere. You know, it's like the things that used to be like. You would never have a girlfriend if you admitted you liked them, like Star Wars or something like yeah. that. It's so much more prevalent today than it used to be. Now, I gotta say, Dungeons and Dragons, man, you got Stranger Indeed. Things, Perfect. Stranger Perfect. Stranger Things, which is all based around Dungeons and Dragons, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so yeah, Stranger Things community. There were a bunch of things that made D anD D, for lack of a better word, cool. Yeah, and it's just way more prominent now. You can see people like admit they play. It used to be like something you had to be embarrassed about. I never right. really understood why it always seemed really fun to me and i never i I don't know i think i think there were a lot of people that they played dungeons and dragons because they couldn't get a girlfriend like they they, they, you Uh, know if if they had a girlfriend they wouldn't be playing dungeons and dragons no i see i I was never like that i was like i need to have a night away from my girlfriend because i want to go play dungeons and dragons (laughs) it's like it's really fun but anyway Do do you think david burns played dungeons and dragons that is a really good question. How could he have avoided playing at least once in his life? I'm sure. With the crowd that he, he ran with? I don't know. I don't know. That's a that's a good question. It should have been some nerds. But so about the crowd, about the audience, I noticed that they seemed because it seemed like a great show. And they show they, they you saw the audience at the beginning of the first bit when he comes out and he's like, I'm going to play you a tape. And they're all into it and stuff. And then through the rest of the show, I started thinking like, wow, like this audience is really subdued. Yeah. Like 
what's going on here? Why, why isn't the audience into this? This is a great show. And then yeah. when it ends, they show the audience again, they're freaking out and dancing and singing yeah. and stuff. And I'm like, that's what I would have expected the whole time. Right. But basically what happened is because of the weird way that they recorded this, which is a probably the fact of the show, I think for this, for this um, concert film is that this was the first thing done in digital audio. This was the first concert filmed in digital audio. I didn't know that. And they were, and it's, it's why it sounds great today when you watch it, mm -hmm. like when you watch it on, I watched it on some crummy streaming service. I don't remember what streaming service it was, but it was free with commercials and it sounded great because it's just pure it, digital. It's on YouTube, by the way, dear listeners. Okay. Right. Uh, it's on YouTube with no ads at all, actually, which is interesting. All right. That makes sense. But, but anyway, so because of the way they were filming it, um, they were concerned about having to mic the crowd and they right. were concerned that, that might mess things up. So they told the crowd not to make any noise. Wow. The Talking idea. Heads came out and they recorded and they said they were, they came out and recorded the worst show the Talking Heads have ever performed because they're an, they're a band that really feeds on audience energy. And yeah. to have them just there with their hands folded in their lap, the Talking Heads were just dead. Like they were just like, yeah. this, you can't do this. So right. they just filmed with no audience there. And then filmed again with an audience there. They did it in different segments so that they wouldn't have to deal with the, you know, lack of air in the room from the from the right, audience. Right, right, yeah. From the audience not participating because they, I guess, they rely on that. So, um, huh. the shots at the end were legit, and the shots at the yeah. beginning were legit. And then I think in the middle, it's just them performing on a soundstage mm -hmm. in LA. What do you What do you think of David Byrne? What are your thoughts? Because you know, I think he's super cool. Okay. Um, in terms of would I like to hang out with him? I was watching this interview that he did and he's almost like too cool. Like it would be yeah. really hard to talk to somebody like that because they're like sort of aloof yeah. because everything has to be like exactly, you know, he's very eclectic and he's trying to, he's trying to back up his eclectic image and it would just be, I, it rubs me a little bit the wrong way, but to see him perform and the stuff that they do, all that makes sense to me. And he's from Baltimore which is pretty cool. Oh, he is. Like okay, that. yeah. Which doesn't seem like somewhere a cool person would be from. And so I like that. I it like that. Uh, wasn't Poe from Baltimore? He died in Baltimore. No, Poe died in Baltimore. He was originally from right. Richmond. Um, oh, right, 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 right. I think okay. that John Waters was from Baltimore. Or oh, jeez. John Waters is definitely okay. just like a very similar yeah. kind of hit. Yeah. You know? so, uh, Even sort of dress and look alike. Kind of, yeah. I could see them hanging out with each other. Yeah, like maybe they totally. went to the same art school or something like that. <laughs> maybe. Um, yeah. yeah, there's definitely a, a linkage there. So maybe Baltimore's is cooler than I thought it was. Who knows? Yeah. Um, I have a friend. I have a friend that really reminds me of David Byrne. He's a David Byrne type. Who's uh, he's very okay. intellectual, um, and he likes he likes all this weird, you know, this weird music I had never heard of, literature I've never heard of, um, and it okay. and it. And it's one of those, uh, I wish I was cool enough to know what he's talking about type of thing. Sure. You know? yeah. and, and, but I always, I always, I often wonder, friend of mine and all, but I often wonder, okay, is he like, like that because he thinks it's cool? Does he really like that stuff? Because he turns his nose up to, to most everything else, you know, anything kind of popular culture. Ah, right. I don't want anything to do with that. Um, so is he like that because, or is, does he do that? Uh, is he really like that? Yeah, I, you know, it's it's a weird. So uh, what I've what I've noticed tension, I guess. It is a weird tension. I I used to always think there's a. I think it was Plato had a quote that said that you know the best stomach is not that which refuses all food, hmm. and I would always think about that when I would meet somebody that was just too good for everything. Everything yeah. was too good. For, you know, this music's not cool enough for me, and I'd always think, wouldn't you like to just be able to sit back and and listen to you know. Bon Jovi and enjoy it. Right. Like, and, right. You know, right. And, and, and like, so, a, and like, a, and like a Miller light, right. Like have, Miller have, light, have yeah, a cheap yeah. beer and, and listen to some, some, right. Wouldn't you be and, happy and, if you just have yeah. a, a Bud light, you know, and, and right. drink that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But what I, so what I've noticed is a lot of the people I know who are really the best at being cool Fonzies, you know, that just everything, they always um, go lowbrow every once in a while. Mm. Like I have, a, I have a friend who's like, Got it. He's always talking about good wine and like sophisticated food, but like every once in a while he'll say something like, Oh no, the Olive Garden is great. <laughs> like, 
okay, um, <laughs> going to the Olive Garden, but is it great? You know, well, so you was, know, when you're there, you're family after all. So, right, right. But I was thinking it sort of establishes your bona fides that you're like, no, I really like these things. I'm not, I don't yeah. just turn up my nose at everything. Like the, the, the problem is though, you don't, then you got to wonder, is he, is he being ironic? Like, is he, is he, is he doing that to be ironic? Like he becomes suspicious, right? Because like PBR is a hipster thing. Like it's cool to drink PB. Right. It's cool to be, you know, highbrow and then drink PBR. Right. right. Uh, there was a time when like hush puppies, remember when the hush puppies were back in style and they're like hush puppies, those are terrible. When I was a kid, like, like only the, the food. No, the hush puppy, the, the, like shoes. the shoes. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay like okay. when I was, when I was a kid, the worst thing that your parents could buy you were, were a pair of hush puppies. Yeah. I remember oh, that. God, you get beat up in the schoolyard. Right. But then they become, yeah. they became hipster cool again. And like that, you, you know, I think it functions like the tail of a peacock. You know how mm. like, a, like a, a male peacock has this huge tail mm-hmm. because he's saying to the female peacocks, I'm so amazing that I can get away with having this giant tail that does nothing <laughs> for me. It's a liability with predators. Right. And I think that when someone is so hip and so cool, they can be like, I can get away with drinking this like crappy can of PBR because yeah. I'm so, all the rest of the things about me are so cool. This is my peacock's tail of, right. of being a dork, you know? So I don't know. It's hard for me to get into the head of cool people. If, if it was, <laughs> if it was, I'd probably be a lot cooler. So, but that's the thing is it's, it's, you know, when, when they do, when they do <clears> these things that are kind of ironic, like if I saw my friend in a Leonard Skinner shirt, I'd be like, why was he wearing a Leonard Skinner shirt? You right. know, why, what possible reason could there be for him to, to uh, be wearing a, an out, outlaw Southern rock? I had a bet with one of my friends when we were in high school and whoever lost the bet, the, 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 the bet was the guy, the other guy would have to wear my friend's Tesla shirt to school. And, <laughs> okay. And then like, like years later, it's like, no, that would have been like ironic. Yeah. Uh, ironic. Cool. Yeah. It was like a year after Tesla was popular. So it would have been super dorky, but if you waited yeah. five years, it would have been ironic. So you right. have to, you exactly. Have to- you gotta hit, gotta hit the sweet spot. Right. I mean, when I was, when I was a kid, the last thing you wanted to wear was, was a pair of high waters. You would beg your mom, like when you're, when you when you went through your growth spurts as a kid, as a as a boy especially, and you put on your jeans and there's an inch oh. of uh, there's an inch of sock showing. Yeah. I you, saw a kid. I saw a kid walking down the street in New York with those the other day, and I was like, uh, somebody just grew two inches in like right, two right. Months. And so you'd beg your mom, but then I was in I don't know I was somewhere the other day, and there's this guy wearing a suit, a suit, right, and his and his his slim fitting hipster pants are high watered by about two inches. Wow. And I'm like, you know, oh, golly, we come around, don't we, as yep. humans? <laughs> Definitely. There's, there's just no sense at all. Eventually, they'll get to hoop skirts, maybe. There'll be a there'll be a hoop skirt. Yeah, there'll be a hoop skirt uh, resurgence, I guess. Yeah, we did a uh, we did a Civil War reenactment in the town where my mom had her gallery, uh-huh. and uh, she wore like a big hoop skirt and stuff like Oof. that. At one point, my friend Mike and I. The, the town was occupied by the Union troops during the course of the reenactment of the battle. So okay. my friend Mike and I snuck upstairs and hung a Confederate flag out of the window oh. of my mom's gallery. So uh. a bunch of Union soldiers came in and like arrested her and took her off to the bridge. <laughs> we, had wow. these photos, we had these photos of my mom and her hoop skirt being like marched off to the bridge. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. It was pretty fun. Like I found the picture the other day. I was like, I can't believe this still exists. It was great. When hoop skirts and powdered wigs come back into fashion, then we'll know that we've truly come as far back around as we probably right. could. Right. You know? Yeah. And um, uh, what do you call it? Um, chastity belts and things like yeah, that. Chastity so. belts, right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's yeah. probably, a, there's probably some people that are into that. Yeah. More- uh, there's, yeah. That's a good point. There are people into everything that is. Yeah. So um, what did you, uh, so what do you know about Jonathan Demi, the director? Not much, not much. Tell me about him. So- I looked at his filmography. The, the one that he did after this was called Something Wild, which I remember really, oh, I remember really wanting to watch that movie. But wow. um, it has, it has like, I think a young Melanie Griffith in it. I never saw it. Uh, he did Married to the Mob, which I remember being like a big deal with Michelle Pfeiffer in it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I that. watched that. I didn't love that movie when I was a kid, but then he did Silence of the Lambs. Oh, did he really? Yeah. Gigantic. I mean, it's, that's that's one of the three movies in 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 the history of the Oscars to win the top five to just sweep the top five categories. Yeah. So I no, I had no idea he did that. I think this was I think this was his directorial debut. If 
I remember it correctly. It might have been. It might have been. Yeah, that's why I was saying uh, maybe, maybe maybe they didn't get a, a proper Hollywood director. Maybe they created a proper Hollywood. But why would you give that's... a one point one point two million dollar budget if he was a nobody? He must have been a somebody, right? Well, I mean that the bu- the budgets. It's hard to talk about talk about the budget because that ad that nineteen eighty four ad was ten million. Right. Remember that that included. When we started digging a little bit deeper, remember it included marketing and included like the PR company and included all that stuff. So they, they said it was like a $10 million for this ad or for, for yeah, to make that ad, it was everything. So I think I'm, I'll bet you anything 1.2 million was like soundstage to pay the, the um, probably to pay the ensemble musicians. Right. It was probably like a whole host of things, not just the cost of actually doing that, you know, the yeah. directors. And then 1.2 million, if it's 1.2 million for everything, that's probably about right. I would say for a music video, right? Yeah, it seems about right. You know, it seems about right. But it doesn't seem like, how, did you see anything in? So, so I didn't even finish with his filmography. He did Philadelphia. Oh, after wow. Something which was also an Oscar winner. And then uh, Rachel getting married, which I thought was a pretty good movie, but that's years and years later. That's, that's neither here nor there. But um, did you see anything in this production that made you think that some terrific auteur director was in charge of it? It seemed like most of the stuff that was happening was stuff David Byrne was doing, like the, right. the, really, the really distinctive stuff, like the, um, I guess the camera work, the camera work must have been the director. You know, maybe he helped with the blocking and stuff like that so that it would look right for the camera work. And Maybe. But, I mean, that, that, that's why I had to go look up, like, why is this considered so good? Because it, it, frankly, it, it's just, if you had four or five cameras, you could pretty much recreate this video with any other band. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, kind of seems yeah. like it. Remember the shots with their shadows? Like they're all in front and they had the lights blazing and then there's huge shadows behind them. Okay. And so David Byrne was kind of like hamming it up for the for the shadow. He was kind of like doing in profile, almost like a what's the guitar player? Um Johnny B. Good. Who who sings that song? Chuck Berry. Yeah, Chuck Berry. So he almost does like a Chuck Berry move, you know, but you see the shadow behind the shadows are huge behind mm-hmm. him on the backdrop there. That was such a cool shot. I really like that shot. Because it yeah. was it was it was him, guitarist, uh, what's her name, the bassist, and then like and then David Byrne, and then the two uh, accompanying singers. So the the and members then, of the band are to give them all their due credit. David Byrne, mm-hmm. lead singer, also guitar player, right? He uh-huh. plays. Yep. Yes. He, he does. Uh-huh. Tina, Tina Weymouth. Uh-huh. Weymouth. I think it's Weymouth. Like, Weymouth. I think uh, she's the bassist. Yeah. yeah. And then her husband Chris France, the drummer, mm-hmm. and then Jerry right. Harrison. So. Yes. That's the, that's the people in the band, all of all of whom have had successful solo stuff on their own. Right. Uh, I'm not going to get into the most success. The, well, I don't know if it's the most successful solo thing any of them did, but it's part of my biggest surprise. So I'll leave it for later. Okay. But all right. I, I read a little bit about all those people. It's pretty interesting. I, it was funny how they, Tina Tina Weymouth and um and Chris Franz had like their own project, and they just like oh. stopped the show in the middle for their own project. Like I. So that David Byrne could put on the big suit, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, they did right. actually kind of, I think they ended up breaking up. I think they did one more album together as the Talking Heads. Uh-huh. And uh, then actually came back in like the early 90s and did mm-hmm. one album. And I remember the song, there was a, there was a what, what am I trying to say? Like a top 40 type song from that album. I actually remember that. It's a pretty good one. I went back and listened to that one too. And then after that, they've just been sort of... Um, I think they're all friendly with each other. It's not like the Beatles or anything. I don't know that because David oh, that Byrne right? sued them because they they um I didn't realize that. Well, they formed they formed a traveling band, the other three members without him because because mm-hmm. he broke up. He walked away, and they're right. like, oh, oh, we're broken up. They found out in an interview that he did that they're broken up. He's like, yeah, we broke up, and then wow. they read his interview okay. and they're like, oh, I guess we're broken up. So the three of them decided to to tour without him and they started a project called all talk no heads he sued them for copyright infringement oh boy so uh, i I think i i think i think there's there's a bit of animosity actually um he when i asked you like what do you think of him he has a reputation i mean he is all about 
total control, you know, micromanaging, you know, micromanaging every piece of it, you know, down to like what everybody wears, yeah. uh, you know, how everything looks. And so not only did he, you know, write the music, the lyrics and everything else, but he also directed them like in concerts and stuff. And, and I think they were fine with it. Right. But then in the end, he just kind of walked away. I think they were kind of left like, you know, what the heck, man? You know, we just did this for 15 years and you just split, you know? I saw, I saw an interview that very much reminds me of what you're saying. There was um, the band Filter, which was mm-hmm. essentially everybody else from the Nine Inch Nails except Trent Reznor. Yeah. And Filter, Filter was their own band for a while. They had a couple of big hits. They did well mm-hmm. for themselves. And I saw an interview where... <laughs> The interviewer, he says to the, I, I don't even see this is the thing. I don't remember the name of the lead singer from Filter, right? But he's yeah, the other yeah. guy from Nine Inch Nails. Right. And he's like, so how does it feel to have walked away from what most people consider to be the most influential band of the 1990s in Nine Inch Nails? And the guy the guy was just like, you could tell he was just like wanted to explode. He was like, um, well, the thing was, it turned into the Trent Reznor show and we didn't right. want to be a part of the Trent Reznor show. Right. I think it's yeah. pretty similar. I think it's a similar I think so kind too. of Trent Reznor is obviously very similar to David Byrne. Like a darker, I was going to say, darker, yeah. Like a darker version, but like an yeah. auteur, you know, like definitely has his own creative vision. And it would have right. been either really wonderful to be paired up with somebody like that. Because yeah. maybe like, like what happened with Brian Wilson and the rest of the Beach Boys. Right, right. They were happy to ride on Brian Wilson's coattails. But some people are not happy in that situation. So Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, the, the Trent Reznor analogy is, is a fantastic one, too, because then... Reznor has gone on to be like, he scores movies mm-hmm. now and, and, and all that stuff. stuff. I've and, seen and, him as an actor in things. I've yeah. seen him. And David know. Byrne does that as well. He, he does musicals and theater and all this other, like, like he's not limited right. to, to just this one thing. I mean, it's kind of like, honestly, it's like Paul McCartney too. Uh, Paul McCartney is the same way. Like he kind of outgrew the Beatles. Lennon stayed where he was at and really didn't want things to change. And yeah. uh, Paul McCartney started going big with like, you know, Sergeant Pepper and, and, uh, and all this rest of this stuff. So but he's, it's but really, he's... it's really raining out here, by the way, if you can't. I don't know oh, is it really? That. Yeah. Oh, it's, that's it's coming down. There's a lot of thunderstorms in Virginia in the summer. It, uh, it was pretty big last night. And I don't know if this is a digression, but uh, it is a digression, but I'm going to do it anyway. I was driving home at dusk yesterday and I looked down the road and there's a rainbow at dusk. Oh. In, the, in towards the east, but then it's like going across the almost dark sky. You can see this rainbow, and I'm watching it. And as I'm watching it, uh, some of that lightning happens that like crosses the sky, like yeah. moving, oh. moving horizontally across the yeah, sky. Yeah. Cool. And it was just like the two things together. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I was like, that's, you know, like about as impressive as an atmospheric phenomenon as you could see, but very cool. So it was, it was aliens. aliens. Had there been aliens? That. Oh, it's aliens, right? Yeah, and aliens, of course. Guys like Trent Reznor and David Byrne are inspired by aliens. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Well, um, but yeah, I think it's a really good analogy. I think it's a, that's the that's the kind of person I think David Byrne is. I don't know. I mean, I was about to say, I don't think he sets out to piss people off or make enemies. He's just doing what he thinks, you know, what he's doing, I guess. Yeah. Um, I so. But I, no, I, he, I also don't want to give like him a that. nice guy in the interview. He just seemed like kind of a, uh, like a big personality, just kind yeah. of little bit of a handful. You know? So I, I read Roger Ebert's review of this and he was just talking about the enthusiasm that mm-hmm. David Byrne has in this concert video and right. how different it was and everything else that was, I mean, this is like not long after the sex pistols and like, there's so much cynicism and, and stuff like that in music. And they, they have like a rock and roll musicality that probably if you were into it was kind of a breath of fresh air to have it come back a little bit to right. have like a little bit of the r&b sound come back into rock and not yeah, so much right you know loud guitars and things like that and well and i think i think concert concert videos too i mean because this this isn't a new genre by any means i mean uh pink floyd's the wall for example came out in the 70s uh-huh. uh led zeppelin had one um i mean the beatles had concert had a concert Absolutely. film um Absolutely. So uh, this is, it's not a new genre, but I think what is new is the performance didn't look like, it, it was like, you know how the, that saying, dance like nobody's watching? It was uh-huh. almost like that. When you have those other concert, um, like Jimmy Page hams it up to the camera. You know what I mean? Because sure. he knows the camera's watching them. And so he's like, 
you know, get in front of the camera and making faces and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, or Robert Plant does that. You know, they just acted like it was a concert. Um, right. Like this is what they do. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, it was like just another day type of thing. And yet, if you thought about it, like I said, with like the structure of the concert and stuff, like this is not a normal concert. Like the, right. int- oh, maybe, maybe it is. But y- you know, one thing I thought of a band that has a very similar way of do a very theatrical way of performing live is U2. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like the opening of Burning Down the House, when you hear that little guitar, there's mm-hmm. kind of like a, uh, a, a, a little guitar riff that introduces it. And then the. the drum, yeah. It's just a, it's just a great build up to the song. Yeah. And the only thing I've ever heard that's kind of like that is the couple of songs off Joshua Tree, when they play those live, the big hits off Joshua Tree, still haven't found what I'm looking for. When that one comes in with the guitar, if it's very similar, and it's just like this whole big, huge, slick production that's really very moving. You know, like if you just let yourself, uh, it's kind of like operatic or something. It's it's yeah. it's a, a whole a whole thing, a whole experience that kind of I, envelops I you in the I love that. I love, yeah. you know, I, I, I totally yeah. agree with what you're saying. My favorite song that does that is uh, Gimme Shelter by the Stones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where it starts out, it starts out with a little bit of that, little bit of the guitar. Yeah. And then you, you get that, that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thing, and then, and then the yeah, drums kick every, in. And, and paint, it black, sudden, paint it black is kind of similar too. Yeah, Actually, I paint think it black Rolling, Stones, Rolling Stones are a pretty good example of that. I think they really, had a good sense of the theatrical. I don't know that the Beatles, I'm sure they were great to watch live, but I don't think it's quite the same thing. Yeah. I don't think they were quite as electrified and quite as, um, quite as sophisticated, but I was thinking, so what I was saying about Roger Ebert is Roger Ebert was talking about the enthusiasm that David Byrne showed. Uh-huh. And I was thinking, I went to this show in Phoenix. I went, I went to go see the Pixies. I wanted to see the Pixies. Yeah. I, it's great that they're still, that they're back together and playing. Mm-hmm. So I went to see them and just incidentally Weezer, was backing oh, up wow so, really so i you know weezer's fine i like weezer they're yeah, cool. i like weezer a lot so i went to go see the pixies and oh man they were so old and run down and like frank black <laughs> was finally up there you know like strumming away and just just yelling into the mic kind of yeah. it was a little bit of a bummer and then yeah. weezer came out and honestly they're not much younger than the pixies uh-huh I mean, they were just like the guy was running around the stage. He got on a scooter yeah. went all the way around the audience on a scooter yeah. while singing. So it was like David Byrne. It was it. You could tell he had watched this video. Right. And, and he was like, that is how you have a concert. That's yeah, that's what, funny because what, what's yeah. that lead singer's name? Weezer. Uh, it's a weird name. Um, come on, everybody. River, River. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what's funny is like in his videos, he's. Good God! Yeah, is that the sound of the rain? When when you're quiet, can you hear that? that the, yeah, that That's is a, that that is a crescendo of rain. Yeah. Yes, that um, was a lot. Of- but no, he um he in his in the music videos he's like totally standing still, you know. Yeah. Uh, as as much as can be. Um, yeah, they play so up the sort of nerd thing, right? Like in the yeah, Buddy yeah, Holly. Exactly. Yeah, no, yeah. not like that at all. At live, it was a whole a whole different thing. So, you think it's time to get into? Uh, Biggest surprise, or did you have more? Yeah, to, absolutely. To game? Absolutely. Do you want to go first? Or you want me to take it? No, go ahead. You, you, you go first. Okay. So my my biggest one was finding out that Psycho Killer was the uh, inspiration for Ice T's Cop Killer. Huh. Cop, uh, I can't think. I actually don't know if I know. Oh, Ice T. I don't know Ice T. That's right. I know Ice okay. Cube pretty well. I, you threw me off for a second. I was like, "What's Cop Killer?" Oh, yeah. Got it. Yeah, uh, you know the song, right? Yeah, yeah. I've heard of it. I, I don't think I know it very well, though. He's cruising down, and he's gonna. Um, uh, it's is it cop killer? Is that was called. We'll see. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I just don't um, know it for some reason. I don't know Ice T. I, I can't. Yeah, think of- he he says that he was he came into the studio one day. He had just just heard the Talking Heads "Psycho Killer" on huh. the radio, and so he came in singing. I'm a psycho killer, you know, and uh, he thought. Oh, I think the song. I think the song is called Body Count. It's Body Count. Yeah, it starts out cop killer. So, but uh, that's that was the inspiration for that 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 song. So I thought that was kind of cool. That was my biggest surprise. How about yours? So this, I've never heard that song. Does it go cop killer? Qu'est-ce que c'est? <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't do the. Doesn't do the qu'est-ce que c'est? Fa 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 fa. Don't yeah, know that, do that, sound. that doesn't sound very hard. For the, no. you know. 
<laughs> it's a little bit, it's a little bit harder than that. Yeah. Okay. All right. How about yours? Yeah, that's a guy we talked about this before, but ice T I think was like classically trained and stuff. I mean, he's like, like, like an artist, like ice T no, that ice cube was the classically. So ice cube, I think went to design school, I believe. I think it was ice cube went to design school of, of Phoenix or whatever. Okay. Uh, I, I see is an air force of that. So he's, okay. he's, he was honorably discharged from the air force after, after serving, you know, full stint came out and did that. Uh, so, but the point is they all got out, you know, they all got out of Compton. So they didn't, they didn't stay there. So that was your biggest surprise was the inspiration yeah. cop killer kid. That that's pretty good. I like that. That's pretty good. Mine is actually similar. Okay. So when I heard that there was the side project, um, Tom, Tom club, and yeah, I saw right. that it was going to be part of the the concert film. I was like, "Oh God!" Like, what? I don't want to hear their like artsy side project. But then they started playing it, and I realized that song "Genius of Love" that was a huge hit. Yeah. And not only not only was that a huge hit, but it's been sampled a million times. Mariah Carey's song "Fantasy," which was a huge hit, samples um, "Genius of Love" by the Tom Tom Club. And then I was out walking around and there's another hip hop song out right now, like a current hit that's out that samples Tom Tom, that samples Genius of Love by Tom 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 Club. There's something about that beat that they do that that is getting adapted over and over again. It's it's a lot like a lot of the P Funk stuff stuff mm -hmm. that ended up all over Dr. Dre and Snoop. There's just something right. about that funky R and B that people took and put into hip hop later in the nineties and two mm thousand. -hmm. But anyway. I thought that was pretty weird. I did not expect Tina Weymouth and Chris Franz to come up with something cool enough to be thrown into hip hop songs like today. <laughs> you know, that, I think that that might be the problem is because they're always living in burned shadow. And um, yeah, in maybe. fact, yeah. He, in fact, he taught Tina how to play bass. Oh, um, was that right? Yeah, because he they need, they couldn't find a bass player. That's and so right. He was like, he was like, Tina, you know, why don't you just play? And she's like, I don't know how to play. And he's like, I'll teach you how. So she's uh -huh. like, okay, so. He taught her how to play bass to play mm. his music so that they could have a, a, a live show, which I thought was great. Um, I mean, their history is really cool. I like that they opened for the Ramones at CBGB mm -hmm. in, uh, in Manhattan. I thought that was really cool. You know, yeah, thought, their style of music playing at CBGB, that's weird. Well, right? I mean, it was it was not what it's famous for anyway. Well, if you think about it, though, it was different. OK, mm -hmm. nobody was doing that. OK, uh, it's kind of like new wave punk. Right. Right. Um, right. And so it wouldn't have been something that people really would have heard before. That country singer that I was mentioning. Um, Quite young. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> Sorry. I got my mind on a million other things right now, and it's not on my money. But D Dwight Yoakam, he, he got famous for playing. He played punk bars on the oh. West Coast. Country, country bars would not touch him because he didn't sound like George Strait or any of the other country right. people. He had like, he was like rockabilly and nobody was doing rockabilly. And so he played yeah. punk bars and he said they loved him because he was different. Right. Got up there and he sounded weird and, and funny. And so I'm sure it was kind of the same thing. You know, they go to CBGB, you're yeah. there to listen to Ramones and this, this, the talking heads go on. And there's this guy, this tall lanky guy dancing, like he dances with this <laughs> chicken neck thing. Uh -huh. And you're like, can, what is this? But it yeah. was good. I can see that. So, I mean, I wouldn't have if I was at CBGB, which is gone, by the way. You can't go. Yeah, there, no. What a shame, that right? That would have been one of the first places I would have checked out in New York. Half of the places I, I closed years ago. There, there was a. I watched uh, Inside Lewin Davis uh, for a future show, and there's like a folk a folk club where Bob Dylan's playing, and I was like, I was like, oh man, where's wow. that? I got to go check that out. Oh, that's it's closed. Club. Yeah. So, there's also there's the Lennox Lounge over on Lennox Avenue. That place is gone. Uh, yeah. That place closed in like 2012. That place had all of the greats from jazz and, and uh, like Ella Fitzgerald and like all of these classics played there back in the day. But the last place for rock, there's only two places really left that can trace the history of like, like rock to those kind of like a CBGB. There's Mothers in Chicago, okay. which I guess we have to call birthing persons. And then there's Whiskey A Go-Go in uh hollywood and that's in it LA. I mean, yeah in la those are the last like two places left <laughs> in the country that saw these yeah. bands you know back i mean i don't know sometimes i'm walking in new york and i see i see a few of the things that still exist there 
Mm-hmm. And it's more surprising to me that anything still exists that was around in the 80s than, yeah. than that everything else is closed. It's so expensive. Right. I don't know how anything. Oh, I walked I into a place. That was in Al- I was in Alphabet City the other day. I walked into this hole-in-the-wall surplus store. Just a little hole-in-the-wall selling really? like military coats and stuff from the West German Army. I was like, how is this place still in business? How- it must be grandfathered or something. Right. Like that. I don't know how you survive. But anyway, so um, what are we doing? This is this is my pick. Yeah. Uh, the question is, so my my only opening arguments would be that we should judge it as a concert film versus right. other concerts. I will leave yeah. the floor to uh, the prosecution. Well, I think I think that's that's really kind of all you need to know. It's sort of like, you know, how do you judge, you know, a classic classic movie that did everything before anybody else did it, and that everybody else kind of bases your stuff off of. I think yep. in in terms of what was there before, and what this was or what this, you know, is and became, um, I, I think, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think the music and the energy, I'm actually going to, um, you know, my daughter Ainsley's really into music. She's just, and she's, she's just all over the place, uh, which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. She has a, she has a mind to just love all kinds of music. And uh, so I'm going to send this to her and tell her to watch it. Um, Cause it's, I think it's that good and it's that worthwhile. Also, she's you know, a budding musician. So I'm going to send it to her, tell her to watch it because I think it's a good lesson in, in what a band should be, right? They don't have any, um, I mean, there's not, I guess I keep going back to, I say simplicity and, and we admit that by the end, they're all on stage and stuff. But the thing is, there's no light show. There's no backdrop, LED backdrop. You know, there's none of this stuff that you have now. There's no lasers. There's no, nothing. It's just them performing. And you know, it's them performing, you know, mm-hmm. ad living and they're jamming, you know, and song, a song that would take three minutes takes like seven or eight minutes, you know, because they're just, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, for, for me, for me, it's, it's simplicity. There's no light show. There's no laser show. There's no led backdrop showing a movie. It's just them okay. like that. Uh, so yeah, I'll toast it. Absolutely. Let's toast it. Okay, cool. Very cool. Yeah, I, uh, my, my daughter is similarly musical and like very eclectic in her music. And I, and I played the Talking Heads for her years ago. Like, oh, I really like, you know, I played Psycho Killers. Like, I really like this song. I listened to it. She was like, yeah, it's okay. I don't really see what the big deal is. And we're being like, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe well, that was at the age she was, if she had a chance to hurt my feelings, she would hurt my feelings. <laughs> yeah, mine's not, mine's not quite there yet. So, all right. All right. So we, cool. we went ahead and talked. So this this is surviving the dose in the classics uh, gauntlet. Yeah, that's right. I, I agree. I mean, I definitely would vote for it. So I think it, I think it was pretty cool. Clinton, did, so do, do we know what we're doing next? It's going to be a book. So it'd be good if you gave me some heads up. I will. Let, I will let you right. know. I will let you know oh, okay. ASAP. How's that? All right. Okay. Sounds good. Going to be a welcome to Kansas travel pamphlet because that'll only be eight pages long. And um... <laughs> right. Right. I'll, I'll figure something out for us. Okay, cool. Sounds good. All right. So for Twisting the Classics, this is Dave MacArthur. And this is Clinton here. Peace out, everybody. Catch you next Bye. time. Bye-bye. That's it for episode 59 of Toasting the Classics. For those playing along at home, get some whiskey, egg whites, simple sugar, and bitters to make a whiskey sour for our discussion of the Coen brothers inside Lewin Davis. If you'd like to get in touch, please send us an email at toastingtheclassics at gmail.com. Send us show ideas, comments, complaints, and let us know your favorite concert film. Check out my blog at theattractivenuisance.com and follow us on Twitter at @attractivenuisance. Our music was written by Michelle MacArthur. See you next time on Toasting the Classics. <laughs> <laughs>